I see uh, we might have over 100 people joining us on the call today and you've joined us from many different places in India and also internationally and can I just say I think the ones from the Philippines are the best at keeping time you were all on there the very first um, but all of you are so welcome we're going to introduce ourselves as faculty today we're going to find out a bit more about yourselves and then we'll look at the actual sessions for today's course. Um, my name is Dr. Moira Leng. I'm a palliative care physician for the last 30 years or more and I have the privilege of working with colleagues in India for 20 years but also working in places like uh, Uganda, Gaza, Sudan and other parts of the world. Um, and I'm part of the faculty for the whole of this course and will be leading on today's session along with my co-facilitator. So uh, Dr. Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon and it's lovely to see you all and uh, we've got good numbers here from across India and from other countries as well. Uh, Moira and myself and the organizing people, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each of you and I hope this uh, entire session will be useful. Uh, we are really thrilled by the numbers and your interest in being part of this. So before we go into the session, uh, we really want it to be an interactive one. Uh, we invite you to put your comments, questions, suggestions on the chat box and we'll uh, constantly have a look at it and reflect back on what you have to say. Uh, so before Moira kicks on, can I ask you uh, to just put in the chat box, what are the main reasons that you thought you would enroll in this? And what do you expect out of this course? Some quick responses would be appreciated. And as you're thinking of how to answer that, and we're looking forward to hearing from you, I also want you to practice something else. You go down to the right hand side at the bottom and you say something that shows reactions. And I'm going to show you just now how I can give a thumbs up or an agreement. So please, any, uh, when we ask, ask you a question, maybe we say how many of you are working with COVID patients, you can just go into that and just give a reaction. And you can also give a particularly hand clap to someone. We just want to get this interacting so you're not going to fall asleep in front of the Zoom this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so someone's, uh, uh, Kakasha, uh, please forgive me if I forget your names, uh, mispronounced, says it's very pertinent to this COVID era. Uh, we also welcome Dr. Rajeshri, who's also joined us uh, here. To, uh, she is a faculty. Uh, she's also joined part of this team now. Uh, uh, yeah, can I ask? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead and put in your comments as to what made you uh, enroll into this course. It'll be good for us to hear and what your expectations are. I'm just adding that to the chat. Um. Can I also just ask, just get a feel of where everybody's from. So we have people from India, uh, particularly from the northern states. We have a big number from Manipur. Have our Manipur colleagues joined us yet? My, our Manipuri colleagues? If you are from Manipur, please give me a tick. I'm not seeing our Manipuri colleagues yet. I think they're maybe coming. And those of you in India, I think you're struggling a bit with the monsoon. So if you're in one of those categories, well done for making it and making it on the Zoom. Jennifer, I think we have some comments. Yeah, we've got some responses, how to deal with palliative patients. We've got a counselor who's uh, joined in, um, hoping this uh, session will help to handle COVID patients. Yeah, how to communicate with COVID patients and their relatives want to see how experts in palliative care deal with the pandemic. So all wonderful responses and we hope this course will cater to your expectations. And uh, keep putting down responses. Lovely, so this is really great. Thank you for getting uh, going with the chat. We really would like this. I know this Zoom, I know we're not meeting face to face, but we can still be listening, asking questions. Sometimes when you ask a question, we'll say that the answers are going to come later in the week. 
sometimes we'll deal with it straight away. Um, we want to try and meet the needs of different people on this call, ones who are used to palliative care, ones who are new, ones who are working in, in the medical side, the counselling side, the social side. So let's see uh, just how much we can all learn together. I think, Jennifer, you can just give me uh, the last few comments there and then we'll start our yeah, first slide. So we've got... Uh it's uh, beautiful that many of them actually put down the learning objectives of this course. Uh, they mm -hmm. want to learn the ethical principles, how to handle psychosocial issues. Um, yeah. How knowledge can be used positively to help COVID patients. Thank you. How to communicate. That's come again. How to manage stress and medical conditions effectively, not just in COVID, but in all palliative care. Great, thank you very much. Lovely, so uh, we'll, we'll every so often stop and have a look at what you're looking in the, at in the chat. I'm delighted that Jennifer as a co-facilitator will keep a close eye on that. But let's start our formal session. So welcome to the ECHO sessions that are part of the overall course, which is palliative care and COVID-19. Um, this is a, a online resource which is supported by these echo sessions. And very importantly, there are webinars which go into things a little bit more detail that are part of this e-learning. But these sessions now are to get the interaction and to get your ideas and questions. Also to help you be familiar and comfortable with using algorithms. You should have had all the material a week in advance. If you have not, please do look at that. Please do prepare for the sessions by looking at the webinars because then you'll come um, more prepared and better able to bring your issues and ideas and particularly try out the algorithms and see if they're working in your clinical practice or if you have any questions about them. Our aim is to train and support and empower you to care for those who are seriously ill during this COVID-19 pandemic. Now that means those who are COVID-19 positive, particularly those who have comorbidities and are deteriorating. We won't be focusing so much on core COVID-19 management because that will be detailed in your setting by your Ministry of Health or your State Health. Of course, we can answer some questions about that, but our core is how do we handle those who are deteriorating? How do we respond to those who have comorbidities? And that is impacting on treatment decisions, also impacting because of COVID-19 and the lack of healthcare access. And what about the needs of the wider community, including healthcare workers, in terms of the stress and the challenges? And you've brought up many of these in your learning objectives. The course is designed around this ebook you see here. So you see that there is an ebook with um, uh, webinars I mentioned. We do also have voiceover PowerPoint. This is because we would love you to be able to use this in your setting as is uh, as appropriate, whether it's to run CMEs, whether it's to share with your colleagues. And you have now joined this online echo session, which is five sessions covering these key areas, these key domains, triage, symptom control, management of distress, end of life care, and the needs of the healthcare worker. We've divided these up into five sessions. We'll be covering these topics, such as today, goals of care and decision-making, ethics, uh, and a little bit of communication, but that will roll over into another day. So these are the domains that we're going to be looking at. And you might be asking, how did we come up with these domains? Well, we looked at, a, a, we had a group of experts involved in designing this course, and then we have taken input from more than a thousand people who have now uh, engaged with us, and also from some of the evidence that is coming out. This is a new area, so evidence is coming out every day. And we're going to be signposting for you and trying to in, encourage discussion interaction, as we said. This week is a Hindi language. Uh, if there are issues in your language and you want to just clarify that, then please do join in on that. In general, we won't ask you to unmute. So if you have a query, Pramita, I can see you have a query, please put it in the chat because there's a lot of us on the call. So we'll use the chat for our queries and our questions rather than um, raising hands for the moment. And uh, yeah, I think that's most of what I want to say. So I just want you, before we go on to the next slide, what is palliative care? You've come on to our course looking at palliative care. 
uh, what is palliative care? If you can put in the chat what you, what you want to say to, in answer to that, what is palliative care? And as you put that in, uh, Jennifer can be looking to see what you've put in the, in the chat. Jennifer, is there anything else in the chat you want to share at the moment? As, as we're asking participants to say, what is palliative care? Yeah, I think uh, one other participant had put management of uh, palliative care non-COVID patients as well during this pandemic as one of their Great. expectations. Great. So we getting some res started getting some responses for what palliative care means to them. Uh, someone has put an important theme as quality of life. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other suggestions from our Doesn't, group? That is from Philippines, I think. Yeah. Okay. Alleviating suffering. Good one. You can keep typing whatever you have understood as palliative care. Doesn't matter. It might be many things together. Management of pain and symptoms to achieve quality of life. Rehabilitation. Adding life to days. I think there are some good responses coming. Wonderful. So thank you for that. And I can see that some of you are very familiar with palliative care. Now, there has been a number of definitions over time. Uh, I'm wanting to share with you a very new uh, consensus definition that came out just in earlier this year, uh, which is encompassing most of what you said. And I'm sure other things are going to come on the chat and Jennifer will share with me in due course. But we're looking at uh, holistic care, so the care of the whole person. We're looking at care across the age and disease spectrum. We're looking at care that can start at health promotion time, but particularly is relevant when there is a serious health problem that is causing suffering. Many of you said alleviating suffering and looking at quality of life. So palliative care is relevant alongside disease treatment and diagnosis, rehabilitation alongside that with a focus on quality of life, a focus on dignity, a focus on patient choice, um, a focus on caregiver and patients being looked at together. And in particular, this new term, serious health-related suffering, which usually means chronic illness, but can take on board issues such as COVID-19. So this definition has come out at a very good time for all of us as we're looking at what does palliative care mean? Of course, palliative care continues on into bereavement. And I want to just say again, some of us are specialists, um, but most palliative care is happening by those on the front line, those in primary care, those on ward-based settings, maybe 80 to 85% of palliative care is integrated into usual healthcare practice. And that's what we want to support this week. There are opportunities to do further training and to take this further. Some of you already are, have done that. Um, but we're talking more about this integrated competencies. Jennifer, anything else that came, yeah, came up on been, the chat? Uh, yes, uh, Moira. Uh, some good uh, phrases. It is patient and family-centric, total care, dealing with people with serious illness, offering holistic comfort, uh, taking care of the medical, psychosocial, emotional needs. Uh, and uh, someone has pointed out the importance of it, especially in this pandemic, with so much of emotional, spiritual uh, difficulties for the patient, relatives, and the need for a lot of support. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So let me just set the scene for, for the next five minutes or so as to why uh, we're all meeting here today. We're just having some, here we go. So palliative care in humanitarian settings or in pandemic responses is actually not new. Um, but what's new at the moment is the scale of this uh, global crisis that we're all in. We have been looking at how palliative care would fit into a humanitarian response in different settings. You see in this picture, uh, this is a Nepal earthquake. These are the Kerala floods. And of course, we're in monsoon time yet again. This is a, a woman who is a caregiver in a refugee camp in northern Uganda, where I have the privilege of having done some work. We have a WHO guideline, which helps us look at this. We have a humanitarian guideline, and we have some interesting literature. So we've been looking at this together. This top one sort of is a bit ironic. This is how palliative care was labeled in the Nepal earthquake. So what is the role of palliative care? And what do we mean by that in humanitarian setting? 
a very nice paper came out in the Lancet early in this pandemic, which I think very helpfully summarized the place of palliative care and it very neatly uh, balanced with this course which we had already started writing and my apologies these COVID statistics are of course out of date um, communication and goals of care and today we're thinking very much about goals of care and decision making symptom control psychosocial and spiritual care end of life care and staff support and these authors who are our colleagues and friends of ours describe this as a tsunami of suffering we're also delighted to see that the WHO has uh, taken time to respond and adjusted their case management guidelines to include palliative care. And some of you are here because your governments have mandated that you should come on this. I know in India, the state level mandates so that we can integrate this. And the governments are also asking us that the WHO through the World Health Assembly is asking us to pay particular attention to the ones that we've been talking about, pre-existing conditions, older persons, those at risk, and include the health professional healthcare workers in this. So who are some of these vulnerable people? Here's our children, a very famous photo of this taken by a photojournalist in the Rohingya camp. So refugees and children. Children, of course, not usually being affected directly by COVID-19, although some are. Um, and there is a, an unusual uh, manifestation of COVID, like a Kawasaki's immune response. But children are very much impacted by what is happening in terms of schooling and isolation and travel and food and basic access. People who are in situations of severe lockdown, these are prisoners. The situation in many, many prisons across the world at the moment is really very, very serious. Migrant workers, this is a picture of Nepali migrant workers trying to get back to India uh, when this COVID-19 um, pandemic was really starting to break out. And we all know the problems that migrant workers have had across the world. And our thoughts go out to Kerala, where migrant workers and others coming back from uh, the Arab Emirates, of course, were involved in a plane crash only in the last couple of days. In some settings, uh, they've been able to bring in these distancing techniques. This is northern Uganda. I'm so impressed to see how people are managing to do the food distribution with distancing, but it can be hard. And of course, we mustn't forget our elders who are uh, particularly at risk and affected. In fact, our co colleagues in care of the elderly medicine are saying this is, in fact, mostly a disease of our elderly patients, not only but it's affecting them to a large degree, and how are we responding to that? We are seeing a lot of challenge, we're seeing a lot of despair, we're seeing a lot of, of trauma and difficulty. We're also seeing moments and acts of compassion and empathy. And I thank you to all who are on this call and all who are health care workers in this situation, whether you're caring for COVID-19 patients directly or not, you are involved in, in responding with compassion and empathy to those who are in need. And you see some just photographs of, of some images there, particularly uh, an image of migrants being offered food on their journey. Let me share with you a, a very deeply human story that came from uh, the US early in the pandemic in April. And it was a conversation between a New York intensive care doctor and an Italian doctor. And of course, Italy had this huge uh, initial problem followed by the New York situation. But let us just look at the experience of one new, uh, American doctor. She's talking about realizing that palliative care was essential. And actually in the bigger article, she says, I wish we had had more training because now she's needing to look at dignity, to think about existential or spiritual distress to think about the patient's priorities, to see people as individuals and make decisions for those individuals, to understand and witness suffering and think about how she responds to that. And she actually says, maybe this is the heart of medicine, this kind of holistic approach alongside, of course, excellent clinical care is the heart of clinical medicine. And there's always something more to be done. And that's something that is a mantra for us in palliative care. And I like her bottom statement there. We need to know that our patients feel seen. Some of us penned this letter in the Lancet, talking particularly about refugee settings. We had just come back from Palestine and Gaza. 
And thinking about our mortality, our common mortality, this pandemic has challenged us all, has it not? To think about whether we would lose a loved one, and maybe some of you have lost loved ones, as well as how we care for our patients. And there's something about, yes, there's social distancing, but there's also a sense of global solidarity as we respond with compassion, with excellent clinical care, as we share our common humanity. We're going to just move on in a moment to the topic of today, which is triage. But uh, Dr. Jennifer, is there anything in the chat or anything you'd like to share or any questions people have before we move on to the topic of today's main session? Yeah, I think when you asked about palliative care, I, this uh, theme of holistic care has emerged and uh, its relevance, especially uh, in a pandemic such as this, with a tsunami of suffering affecting uh, people across the globe. And uh, we are all hit in some ways. And so we are kind of moved, even as we do this course, uh, with a lot of empathy. And uh, uh, yeah, people have commented on good death and um, ensuring good end of life and good quality of life. So thank you to everyone. So we're now going to move on to the topic of, of today, which is triage and decision making. Um, we're going to share some principles. We're also going to share an algorithm. Uh, if you haven't looked at these algorithms, please do look at them because it's very useful for us to know uh, if you're finding them useful in your, in your clinical setting. And we're going to use a clinical narrative, a family that are affected by COVID-19 as an example all week. So we're going to follow that clinical narrative through the week as we look at the different topics. So let us start that topic today. So decision making and triage. This is uh, quite an important issue. It's an issue that is attracting a lot of attention. Um, it's an issue that's attracting a lot of controversy. And underpinning these decision making, this decision making is core communication, but also ethical principles. Now in the webinar, and remember the webinars are the longer lectures that we have online, we talk more about the basics of ethics. Um, but in this session, we're going to talk more about how we apply those ethics and um, those ethical principles in practice. But as a small reminder, I want you to see if you can remember what are the four pillars of medical ethics. So any of you who remember that, uh, just pop them in. What are the four principles of medical ethics? And then we're going to be balancing those as we go forward. We're going to look at a clinical scenario, as I mentioned. We're going to look at the, the algorithms that support this. And we're going to think of our own values and how they may impact our decision making. Because what we don't want to do is simply make a decision in a panic in an emergency situation. We want to have a framework for thinking through these issues in advance. Can I also suggest, in addition to the PDF here, of the, of, sorry, in addition to the link to the e-resource, can I mention this app, PaliCare app, developed in Bangalore. I use it all over the world when I teach. It's a simple app for adult symptom control. Very useful to have on your phone if you're wanting a quick access to an English language a symptom control um, application. It's there in uh, Apple and in Android. PaliCare with a capital K. Okay, so how are we getting on, Jennifer? Do we have any uh, ethical principles in our chat as yet? Yeah, we've got all four of them listed. Patient autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Wonderful. Great. So thank you for that. So these are our core ethical principles we learn about, and then we apply them in our clinical settings. And of course, when the situation is urgent or when people reach the end of life, sometimes these become particularly challenging. They're also challenging when we have constrained resources. And I don't think there's any of us who are facing these times without a sense of constrained resources, either financial or human. These are uh, cu not culturally dependent, uh, but they do have relevance in our cultural settings and that may come out in our discussions and please let us as we go on think about how these ethical principles play out in our settings. They're not laws and ideally our legal frameworks are underpinned by these ethical frameworks. I know in India, for example, there have been big changes in some of the uh, legislation around end of life care, for example, and that has brought Indian legislation more in line with these ethical principles, though not without challenges. And of course, we are focusing on the needs uh, of the patient and the context that they're in. 
we're looking at the benefits and burdens of disease de decision making, balancing these autonomy. Autonomy, what does the patient and the family want? Patient first, but of course we live in societies where the family also have a big say in what happens. How are we going to work to, to assess what is beneficial to someone and what is not doing them harm? And that's important, isn't it? And how are we going to look at the perspective of the wider society and the resources that we have? And is this balance uh, achievable or does it feel impossible? Like this picture where we have an impossible situation to balance. Do we feel like we're in a maze trying to find our way through? Um, or do we feel we know how to go? I'd just love to hear from you. Do you feel when faced with, for example, decision making on whether to escalate treatment for patients with COVID-19, do you feel that this is a maze and a panic? Or do you feel that you, that you feel there is a way through? Just uh, Jennifer, any, anything in the chat just now? Not yet. You can put down on the on the chat your challenges. How do you feel? Confident? Difficult? Please put down. Do you feel mm -hmm. lost? Do you feel confident? And you can even think it. Sometimes you can put it in the chat. Sometimes you can think it. But there are some challenges for us. We have vulnerable patients and families. We have uh, quite a lot of desperation. We have unequal access to resources in many of our settings, as well as inadequate resources. The holistic issues are often ignored. So we're focusing on, should we give hydroxychloroquine? Should we transfer the patient? Not really on the holistic needs. And yet the holistic needs may be the most important. There's stigma, there's fear. We're using words like suspects. We're finding communities expressing a great deal of stigma um, to those who might be positive, even to the level that people don't want to present with their illness. And of course, this came on in a relatively unexpected way and we're under pressure. Over to you, Dr. Jennifer. There are some, uh, some comments coming through. So it is difficult to start with, feels like being in a maze, but achievable. Uh, someone has put a question saying, how can, we ensure autonomy in the Indian setting, rural, semi-urban, uneducated section of population. Feel confident most of the time, but not every time. Can lead to burnout making such decisions. I think, thank you for putting your putting down very honestly uh, what it actually means. And some of these things we're going to be exploring as the week goes on. So you brought up already a very important issue, and that is what does autonomy look like in your setting? You've mentioned a rural Indian setting. We've colleagues from the Philippines, I think also from Indonesia that have joined us. Um, and many of these settings are actually quite communal in how we make decisions. And yet we're talking about autonomy of the person. Very important. Let's see how we get on discussing this with a patient. So Mr. Ramesh, we're going to look at him and his family situation this week. He's 75 years old. He has multiple comorbidities, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, obesity. We know that obesity on its own now is a very significant factor in um, how people are, uh, how the outcomes for COVID-19 infection. He's had a stroke six months ago, which has left him with a very dense uh, weakness down one side and frequent chest infections. He's housebound and is needing help with most daily tasks and the care is coming from his wife and daughter-in-laws and son. And this is not, maybe the details would be different in your setting, but this idea of a gentleman in his 70s with complex comorbidities now in the COVID era. So I just want you to look at this scenario because we're going to be expanding and working on this case narrative. But what are the issues that you're seeing just in what I've told you so far that are going to impact our decisions as we think of how to care for this gentleman in uh, COVID-19 era. So any things, again, just think through, maybe start sharing, what are the issues you're seeing here that are going to impact as we look at treatment decisions and interventions for this gentleman now and for this gentleman if he was to be exposed to COVID-19. And Jennifer, just when anything comes up, you can share. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Catherine has mentioned financial issues, which is very relevant. Mm -hmm. The different comorbidities, exhaustion of caregivers. 
um, yeah, Ramesh has got multiple comorbidities. Uh, his dependency on his caregiver, he's got a, already seems like he has a poor quality of life, communication, polypharmacy, prognosis, yes, caregiver burnout. So we've got some medical factors, we've got financial issues, we've got caregiver issues, contagion of virus since caregivers are his immediate family, yes. Uh, we don't know Ramesh is yet uh, infected or not. Lovely. So, so thank you so much for that. So you, you're just beginning to think your way into this situation. And, I, and thank you for also remembering that there's going to be big challenges for this family, even if he never has COVID-19. How is he going to access his medicines? What about the financial implications? We don't know much about the social circumstances. We're going to find out more in due course. Um, but also, we're, we're beginning to think of what happens to an elderly person with multiple comorbidities if they are exposed to COVID-19. Let me show you a couple of slides and then I'll ask you another question. So this is a, a big trial that was reported um, which was looking at what happens to people who are admitted to hospital. Um, and you see here a, a very obvious uh, shaped curve which says if you're younger, you tend to do quite well. Uh, not None in this scenario have died. Uh, some needed ongoing care, but the majority were discharged. But as you go up the age, you can see more and more people in this age group, Ramesh comes into this line here, are actually dying or needing ongoing care. Not so many are needing discharged. So we know that those who are needing particularly mechanical ventilation or who are being considered for that are doing very badly if they're elderly and if they have a lot of comorbidities. Now, the question has been asked, are we simply writing off our elderly population? This came up from uh, colleagues in Europe, for example, in high income settings, and they were saying, maybe we should just have a cutoff and everybody over the age of 70, we should not consider for escalating treatment. I wonder if you have any suggestions about that. Should we use a cutoff to say over this age, you have this treatment, under this age, you have this treatment? What do we say to our elderly people if they're scared that they're not going to be treated in COVID-19 because we're going to favor the younger people in and neglect our older people? Any thoughts on that from our, from our group? So I think I'm already seeing this interesting here. I'm seeing you're bringing up some anxiety and religious factors. So one of you have said it is unethical, unethical to do a cutoff. That's a very clear statement. Do you agree with that statement? I'm just getting a little controversy going. Jennifer, tell me what's coming up in the chat. I think we might have lost Jennifer, so let me look myself. Okay, so this is an ethical dilemma. Thank you. Uh, most of you are saying that it's unethical. Everyone has a right to life. Okay, excellent. I like uh, the suggestion that we should be doing case by case. Thank you for that. Aha, uh -huh, but you have said resources. Maybe we're going to be short of resources. I like Gita, thank you. You are saying that this is a team decision. So this is not all on my shoulders. Whatever my role is, this is not all on my shoulders. Some of you are saying, let's apply the principles of medical ethics. Let's get the family involved, really important. But our ethics do also, because remember we said we weren't going to do any harm. So if we know that a treatment intervention is liable to cause more harm than good, then we must be very careful about suggesting that treatment op option. Maybe even ethically, we should not suggest that treatment option. Very interesting. I'm seeing the four box method from Carmel. Carmel, is that the four box method? Are you meeting, meaning four boxes as in the four principles? It'd be nice to know what you know from that. And no clean cutoff. Okay, I really like what's happening. Um, uh -huh. And I like the fact you're saying non-maleficence is being violated. So this is the scenario. Thank you for seeing that this is a true dilemma. And how do we find our way through? And it's good to have Jennifer back. She, she briefly dropped off the call. There is a really good series of briefings, uh, about 21 of them, 
on uh, palliative care issues being produced by the four major global palliative care organizations and many of us faculty in this course have been involved in these briefings and I just put up here just to let us look at it the ethical uh, the bioethics briefing and they are putting in some principles not not just the four autonomy but just how that works out in practice and I like that the very first one is non-abandonment no one should fear that feel that they are being neglected they are being written off that we are saying simply because of xyz we don't even consider whether you should be treated that we must uh, um, use autonomy as our as a principle that is very very important and confidentiality but we have to apply that in the circumstances and when you do your communication session you particularly look at how do we do that involving the family but the general principle is we take permission don't we we don't get into a situation where we are telling relative things that we're not telling the fam the person unless we have the permission from that person and ideally we have the conversations together there are circumstances where the patient chooses not to know they're too unwell um, and in that circumstance we do talk to the family only and of course we're looking at balancing justice and fairness but i think our colleagues in europe got too caught up on if we have two icu beds who gets it first ideally we make this clinical decision on that individual on the needs of that person, on the available resources, and then we look and see how we can make that decision go into practice. And I'm going to come to an ethical framework in a moment. I'm going to ask you to take Ramesh and the story we have through that ethical framework using an algorithm. A little bit more background. You may have some uh, very clear guidelines in place. Uh, Kerala, uh, where this whole course uh, came from originally, um, had very good guidelines in place and some of that had come from experience in the Kerala floods, as I mentioned, but also in managing the Nipah virus, which had quite a few similarities to COVID-19, but of course did not spread so widely. So they have a very clear uh, system of how you uh, do community surveillance right up to treatment centres and also how you offer holistic support. And palliative care is integrated throughout the the system at state level so it's a good exemplar and you see more of that discussion in your books can, I come, in, can sure. I come in Moira um, mm -hmm. Kamil had mentioned about the four box method is mm -hmm. earlier what mm -hmm. do you mean uh, under mentions on that is our indications patient preference quality of life and contextual features so good. this can be used by the team uh, to help in decision making. Thank you, Karma. That's interesting, and that's a, that's a, a, a way in which you can apply these in a structured way. So thank you for that. Be interesting for you to keep in mind that system you're using there in, in the Philippines, and to look at the algorithms we'll share in a moment. So thank you for that. This algorithm, I'm afraid, is difficult to read online, but this is a goals of care. Because one of the really key discussions we need to have with our, our uh, patients like Ramesh and his family early on maybe even before they're exposed to COVID-19 are what are the likely scenarios you know let's start having these conversations early not let's not wait to the emergency room when people are hypoxic and are in trouble let's start having conversations about what might happen let's make sure we're maximizing the care for the comorbidities let's make sure we're starting to have conversations about what might happen particularly those of you in rural areas particularly those of you in primary care or in palliative care already, so that we're beginning to prepare the way for difficult triage conversations. So this is our triage algorithm. It's been designed with green, yellow and red, taking us through green, which is kind of straightforward. People who have uh, no real comorbidities or challenges in terms of the ethical decision making for treatment. And in which case we should continue with the local, locally agreed uh, treatment guidelines, of course, with holistic care involved. But I want you to look through the yellow and through the red sections. These are to try and help us move step by step, uh, a little bit like your four box, but this time in an algorithm. And I want you to think of where Ramesh is going to sit. So we see a patient with COVID-19 who has comorbidities pre-COVID pre performance status. Now, the tools we can use to measure that are varied. We've chosen in the algorithm to suggest 
using the WHO performance scale. And uh, maybe you can be thinking, what is, is Ramesh's WHO performance scale? If you're using other tools, let us know. But some way of assessing the comorbidities and the functionality of the person before we start. And then we think, are they likely or are they not likely to benefit? So do you, if they're likely to benefit, then we carry on, not necessarily always escalating to ICU, but we do step by step. So there may be a disease treatment escalation we can do in our setting. It may involve, for example, high flow oxygen, or it may involve transfer to the next COVID treatment center. Or we come down the red side, we're saying unlikely to benefit. In that circumstance, we should make a team decision. Thank you for the person who suggested that. We should bring in this concept of futility. We shouldn't be doing something that is not likely to benefit and very likely to cause harm. Yeah, we keep giving holistic care. We communicate this with the family and the patient if possible, and then we document carefully. Of course, we then may see the patient improve and we go down uh, um, keep being very careful to offer good symptom management and holistic care. Or we may have to move into looking at end of life care and the settings for that. We'll discuss that later in the week. So any thoughts, first of all, of where Ramesh would fit in this scenario and any, any thoughts as to whether or not he's likely or unlikely to benefit and what his WHO performance scale should be. Dr. Jennifer, anything coming up in the chat? Yeah, so uh, you've all begun their thinking mm -hmm. and uh, the commonest response has been yellow might turn to red, start from yellow to red. There's one response very clearly red. Uh, so most of them feel start with yellow and move on to red. Okay, so yellow to red. Thank you. Okay, anyone know what his WHO performance status would be? Any of you familiar with that? If you're using another tool, do tell us. So I'm seeing, yeah, I'm seeing most of you are thinking yellow, start at yellow, might turn to red. Excellent. What about his WHO performance status? I'm asking you to try and remember. I'm going to show you on the next slide. So don't worry if you try and remember. Um, and I'd quite like you this week to be trying out this tool and thinking, would it work in your setting? Or are there things in your setting that would make this difficult? Let me just move to the next slide. So what we have here is uh, a framework to allow us to make effective decisions, to communicate and document, very important to document. Now, if you're documenting something that is controversial, if you have family that are very anxious about this, then what I suggest you do is you do it in stages. Ideally, these conversations start when you know someone has comorbidities and is at risk. Then they continue when they're exposed to COVID-19 and shown to be positive. They continue depending on whether the situation is of moderate or severe symptoms. We take into account futility, as I've mentioned, and when you're communicating, ideally it's with the patient, but you include the family. And if you find there is a very difficult uh, dilemma happening, bring in others. In some hospitals, that's an ethical uh, committee. In some settings, that's having a senior person that you can refer to and ask. Some hospitals have different ways of doing that. But the important thing is the documentation and the communication and remembering that um, you must give effective holistic care, effective symptom control, and if appropriate, effective end of life care while you're making these decisions. Never let someone feel that you're saying you're not to get this, this treatment and therefore you are rejected or neglected. If family feel, families feel that you are not caring for their loved one, then they're going to find it very, very difficult to understand the treatment decisions that you're making. So communication is vital here. Dr. Jennifer, anything coming up in the chat? Yeah, so we've got a couple of uh, responses regarding Ramesh's WHO performance status. They've identified that he would be performance status four. Lovely. So let me just look at that here. So exactly, uh, performance four and sometimes three. So this is simply a way of saying how much was this person able to do? Now that comes back to seeing them as an individual because you may have a 75 year old person who is looking after themselves, who is doing daily yoga, who is walking out and looking after grandchildren. 
and he's not got many comorbidities and has good pre-functional status. You may have people who have comorbidities, but those comorbidities are not seriously impacting on their health at the moment. They may impact on their COVID outcomes, such as obesity, such as diabetes, they're actually at the moment quite fit and well. So that would take you down very carefully down the yellow pathway. Yeah, yellow pathway. They have comorbidities, but their symptom condition is good. It might even take you down the green pathway. So we're beginning to make this uh, individual. Now, there are other tools out there. Uh, the UK is using and, the, and Canada are using a nice tool called the Clinical Frailty Score, which is, I suppose, a bit more designed towards the elderly population. But again, on the score, if you're six or seven um, or eight, then that would fit with WHO performance three or four. And they bring in a new category, which is terminally ill. Anyone who has a very short prognosis, perhaps less than six months, we need to be thinking quite carefully about the benefits of any disease escalation. This does not mean that people who are elderly do not get treatment. It does not mean that those who are frail uh, do not get treatment. It means we're trying to make a decision for the best treatment that will be of great, be greatest benefit. Also, it's been very interesting. I was talking to an ICU colleague just the other day, and in the early days of this pandemic, high income countries were affected and they ventilated so many people. And then they found actually that their results were sometimes worse. So we're learning every day and we must adjust our treatment algorithms to anything new that comes out in terms of research. But we are finding out that, in fact, if you can treat without mechanical ventilation, uh, you have better outcomes if possible. And people are much more looking at how to do that. Colleagues in, in uh, ICU are using things like organ failure scores to predict outcomes. This is more something you do when you refer to your ICU colleagues. And many of you will not be doing that. Many of you will be managing patients with moderate um, and mild symptoms in your own settings and making appropriate decisions about treatment escalation, um, which may or may not include referral to a setting with ICU. Okay, any other comments, Dr. Jennifer, at the moment? Uh, no, why not? Lovely. Okay. So let me just add in a few more things about Ramesh. So you knew about his comorbidities, and you have already told me he's got WHO performance status four, uh, three or four, and high clinical frailty score. So we know he's unlikely to do well if he develops severe complications. Let's tell you a little bit more about the story. He himself is a retired mechanic. His wife. Uh, is there with him and two sons. One son is running a provision store. His other son has just returned from the Gulf and they're on home quarantine and they live in two houses in a semi-urban area. He used to be very active, but he, we now know he's housebound. We knew that already. But here we have the relatives calling them, warning he's at risk and he's getting very, very anxious. Some of you told me earlier that you thought he was going to be, there was a lot of anxiety in this scenario. And he's asking about whether elderly care are going to be treated. We've already talked about that a bit. But are there any other issues now coming up in this scenario? Any other holistic issues that you think are going to be important for us if we're going to give effective holistic care to this gentleman and his family? Any suggestions? like what you pointed out we are not just looking at the medical issues or just the medical decision making we are looking at psychosocial financial emotional issues that come along um, so in this scenario if you can put down if you can identify some of the possible difficulties challenges that this family or ramesh may be facing Yes, thank you. Fear of being neglected due to financial issues. Uh, you've also said it's important to have good communication, counseling, to alleviate fear, uh, possible stigma. Yes, very important issue. <laughs> Neighbors may cause more anxiety. <laughs> yes, all family members should be allowed to share their thoughts. Uh, sort of family meeting is important. Very good. I talk about unfinished business. Yeah, you are thinking social isolation just in case he's 
um, infected. Yeah, social isolation for patient, family, family counsel, counseling, ensure non-abandonment. Thank you. Yeah, fear of not having personal space in relation to uh, social distancing. Yeah, I think you've really brought out some very important issues, starting from isolation to uh, anxiety to stigma to finances and emphasized on uh, non-abandonment, uh, good counseling. Mm. Yeah, I think pretty much they've touched on many issues. Wonderful. Mental anguish, yes. So thank you for, for uh, just showing how you can identify and start to address holistic issues even in the context of decision making and triage. So what, we, what we've done today together is show that we can begin to understand the holistic needs of this gentleman and his family. We can begin to see the ways in which we need to be involved in supporting this gentleman and his family right now before he develops COVID-19, but we've also begun to think of how we might take him through a decision making uh, pathway should he develop COVID-19 and the likelihood is we would not be suggesting disease as, uh, treatment escalation but we would be giving him the best possible symptom control and holistic care in his own setting. Now you mentioned stigma this is a big issue we'll come up again this week and um, but we are seeing this in a big way. I work in Africa for quite a lot of the time and this we really haven't seen this kind of stigma since the days of HIV AIDS and um, this is causing huge problems. It's causing problems for doctors unable to return or, or, or healthcare workers to their lodgings. It's causing problems for neighbours. As countries are beginning to say, should we manage mild COVID-19 patients at home? It's only beginning in most of the low and middle income countries. It's become quite normal in higher income countries. The, one of the key figures that's stopping us is the stigma. Uh, so this is important that we begin to try and address this, understand the medical aspects, but also involve uh, people like community leaders, religious leaders, um, uh, maybe look at community empowerment models. That's one of the reasons why the Kerala model works well using the ASHA uh, cohort. Of course, we've seen that in India, the ASHA cohort is struggling. Philippines, I don't know what would be the ways in which you would communicate effectively with the community. Please tell us in the chat. I've just been talking to colleagues from the refugee camps in Northern Uganda. They're using radio and other methods to try and, and address these community stigma areas because they were finding even when someone got better, they were struggling to discharge them home. Jennifer, any other issues coming up in the chat? Yeah, I think uh, someone as uh, Dr. Kahasha has mentioned, everyone is fearful for their life. This has somehow taken away the essence of humanity mm -hmm. uh, with relation to neighbors. Response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true, isn't it? That our sense of be, you know, we, we begun to be, begin to be quite isolated uh, in terms of our thinking as well as our physical setting if we're not careful with this and everybody gets pretty frightened. Now, we're coming towards the end of the set sessions, but, but Dr. Jennifer, I'm aware that someone has asked, uh, we're going to pick it up in communication, but what are the issues about the son? I mean, this is a son who's come back from the Gulf. Do you think he might be having some problems? What do you think is in his mind? He's traveled during the pandemic time. I think this brings up the issues even of people feeling guilty. Have I brought this disease into my family? Is there some way in which if my father gets ill, um, it's going to be my fault because maybe I traveled and brought this disease in. But we're also, we didn't really touch on how we're going to communicate. What happens if Manish phones and wants to talk about this? and not Dr. Ramesh. Dr. Jennifer, I'm going to put a question to you you weren't expecting. You lead the palliative care program, CMC Velour, a very big um, uh, well-known hospital, which has got a, a very big uh, cohort of COVID-19 patients. How do you handle this issue of whether to speak to the patient themselves or to the families, Dr. Jennifer? Yeah, thank you, Moira. So, uh, CMC at the moment has got at least uh, 900 plus COVID patients admitted. Um, uh, as of now, we are admitting both asymptomatic, all, uh, all patients who are positive. So they may be asymptomatic, they may be mild uh, patients. And uh, the 
needs of even these asymptomatic to mild patients is uh, huge, humongous, meaning there is starting from fear, anxiety, isolation, finances, uh, most, uh, most of the things which we have already discussed, you know, and uh, how do we address this? So like we, uh, like Moira uh, highlighted earlier, there it is important to provide holistic care. The medical care is only part of what we do for these patients. Uh, it's important to remember the psychosocial, emotional and spiritual needs of the patient and the family. So sometimes because of limited PPE, because of limited number of people who can actually get to the patient and the family, the doctor on the floor itself might need to play the role of an interdisciplinary team. You know, we talk about a multidisciplinary team with social workers, psychologists, nurses, but it is just that those who are there will need to cater to the needs of these patients. And communication plays a huge role. You no know, patients are so happy when someone just comes and talks to them. Uh, you can use methods like getting uh, the patient to talk to the family, connecting to through telephone, video calls, uh, listening to them, reassuring them, allaying their anxiety. Uh, these can be these are things that can be done by any human being, I would suppose at this point. And so much of this can happen through a doctor. In some places, like in CMC, we are fortunate to have chaplains, psychologists who sometimes go in and talk to these patients, uh, connect them to their families, update them every day, and uh, uh, sometimes say a small prayer with them, and uh, different ways how uh, patients can feel connected. Because I, I remember one of the doctors saying, uh, she goes and says, we are your family. We know your family is unable to be with you, but we are now playing the role of family. And uh, she got a letter back from that particular uh, patient after getting discharged. Thank you for playing the role of a family. So uh, I think even though some boundaries are limited, the boundaries as to how much we can do is also uh, widened. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. Thank you for sharing your experience. And I think you told me before you have as much as 900 COVID-19 patients you're caring for at the moment. I am loving the answers you put in here. Thank you for beginning to really tease out what is happening for this son. And you've talked about situations where people are abandoned, but what we're seeing, and I think Dr. Jennifer was telling us, that we have the opportunity to, to help bring that humanity back and to help people with their fears, with their panic, with their sense of um, being overwhelmed. And that applies to us as well as to the families so that we can come back. I love the way someone said maybe COVID-19 is going to bring us back to some of those core principles of compassion and empathy, community cohesiveness, operating together, thinking of what is the best good for another person and for my community. You've also brought in existential and spiritual issues. Thank you for doing that. This is, the, this is perhaps one of the areas where people are thinking about in a way they haven't. What is going to happen to me? I was hearing in the UK, people are making wills more than they've ever made before. What are the sources of meaning and hope and purpose in our lives? And how are these being impacted by the pandemic? What are the things that we need to be forgiven for? Where are the areas of guilt and fear that need to be exposed? Isn't this wonderful that we can look at um, illness, if you like, in this broad way, and rather than in this narrow disease focused way? I'm going to just finish the last few slides and then we're going to have a few questions at the end to think a bit more. So you've told me all of these things, the importance of being present, the importance of how we communicate, preserving the dignity, finding and refinding and refocusing on empathy and compassion and teamwork. And this session, we've really been talking about this continuum of care, how we apply the ethical frameworks in, how we document, communicate, how we do um, holistic support and how we ensure we care for the individual. And so I come back to that story I mentioned some time ago. And thank you for bringing in these aspects of common humanity. This is an Italian doctor speaking to a New York doctor. The Italian doctor is overwhelmed, huge numbers of patients, unprecedented. And he's saying, I'm having to block off from being human. I'm having to separate to protect myself. I have to almost forget it's a person who's there. That's quite dangerous, isn't it? But quite understandable. 
And then the New York doctor is saying, yes, these are, they are conversing together. She's saying, yes, I'm used to doing everything for my patient. She's coming from a high income setting, maybe in low and middle income setting. We are more used to how we balance resources, but she's not. She's used to doing everything and suddenly she can't do this. And this line, I have never felt less useful as a doctor. When we feel helpless, it's very difficult, isn't it? And I don't know whether any of you in the face of COVID-19 may even be feeling helpless. But what I love is they both come back to the place where they say, staying human is actually where we need to be. In fact, it's going through that cycle of, I don't know how I can do this. I don't know how to be useful to finding that there is always something we can do in that setting as a team to help us handle the situation and to support our patients. I teach in Gaza and I find that a very um, challenging and inspiring uh, place to teach because this is a place where inhumanity and lockdown is the norm. They've been in lockdown for 11 years. And a young Gaza student, when I was teaching palliative care to undergraduate students, I asked, what do you see are the values of palliative care? And he said this, humanity until infinity. It's a lovely concept. It's made me think quite a lot since. What does it mean to be human and to show that to infinity? Of course, we need to do that in a context of looking after ourselves. We'll think about that later this week. How do we think of how we can support these last conversations? We'll think of that again as we go through this week. This is this gentleman, Efran Khan, and um, didn't die of COVID-19, but died during this pandemic of, um, of cancer. And he wrote some very moving things, but he talked about the importance and the painfulness of saying goodbye. And some of what we're doing with patients is enabling those conversations to happen. So that physical distancing, but socially together and globally together. We have a lot of references for you in your, in your uh, set. Look at those references. There's many, many from different parts of the world. Um, but I'm going to come out of the slides now. We have, I think, around 10 minutes. And we'll just pick up what you're saying in the chat and uh, see set the scene for the rest of this week. Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer, anything in the chat that you want to share? Yeah, so um, uh, we have Dr. Sandeep saying that especially pediatric um, mm -hmm. uh, okay sorry I might be reading the one um, yeah about pediatric small children being afraid of PPEs and uh, that's scaring mm -hmm. them so recently uh, one of my friends uh, had to get, go in with her one and a half year old child into hospital because he tested positive and uh, the initial two days, apparently, this boy was screaming every time someone came in with a PPE. But uh, slowly, a nurse learned to come in, come in with a ball, with some toys. And at the end, after two days and after a few days, uh, she was showing pictures of how he was uh, giving hi-fi to them, playing alongside them. So uh, I agree, it is scary, but we need to really think out of the box how we can put smileys, pictures, draw something, uh, something to uh, bring down their fears. Uh, Lovely. And I think, Dr. Sandeep, you've also talked about learning to be human first. I think that's something we can together encourage one another and uh, just find ways that we can we can encourage one another in that business and maybe maybe that sense of hope is lovely that sense that this is not a despairing thing, but this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate what it is we're trained for and to empower and support our communities and our families to make a difference in this time. Any last questions or comments? Uh, if not, we'll, um, we'll finish on time for today. And remember, you can be bringing up questions and comments at any time. If we don't handle them in the sessions, we'll handle them later in the day, later in the week. Uh, we have uh, Shiv Kumar say, some patient attenders fight with us because of this happy hypoxia. Okay, so that is this, uh, this is, so delirium is a really big issue and actually you're leading very nicely in tomorrow's session, which will look at symptoms and one of the symptoms we'll look at is delirium. Um, and of course, this, we've got this odd situation where people are very hypoxic that may appear uh, to be relatively unwell. Now, what used to happen to those people is that they were quickly ventilated if they were found. I think what we're realizing more and more now from the physician point of view is actually supporting with oxygen is the best treatment there. And if it's agitation or delirium, treating with that. But that will be tomorrow's session. So thank you for that. Yeah, we've also, uh, 
got to must say the stigma of covid is difficult to deal any suggestions any suggestions from the group can you please put in yeah and, and stigma is also something we pick up again later in the week so let's continue to be thinking about these things and maybe coming to to, to the next few sessions with ideas for that any other questions We'll use the chat, I think, rather than the audio, just because of the numbers that are there. I think we're just about ready to uh, finish our time today. I don't. Yeah. So I want to. I want to thank everyone for their input. I want to thank you for uh, really engaging. Um, I, we're noting these things that Dr. Jennifer, we will be briefing tomorrow's faculty. So policies. Um, and also some of the issues of stigma and symptom. In terms of government policies, the important thing is to know what they are. We can't tell you one size fits all because there's going to be different ones in different settings. So please find your treatment guidelines for your setting, have a look at them, and then come with any questions or queries about how we apply those treatment policies. And do look at the WHO. WHO site, I think, is absolutely fantastic. And the range of options, the posters, even the things on addressing stigma, very, very importantly, lessons from the Ebola pandemic, for example, in Africa was get the community involved early. Don't make it a medical thing that you're imposing on people or a political thing that you're imposing on people. Get the community really engaged and involved and finding their solutions to dealing with the stigma, dealing with the isolation, dealing with the social um, fears and solidarity. So that is the sort of key message I would say about uh, stigma in general. But I thank you for your input and I look forward to us learning more about humanity until infinity this week. I think I'll thank Dr. Jennifer as well for her input and pass back to Palim India uh, just for the last session, last uh, comment. Thank you, Palim India. Thank you, Dr. Moira, and thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for excellent facilitation and to all our participants for being so interactive and very key issues which we hope to address over the next few days. Um, and uh, before you leave, I will request that you take some time to uh, go over the pre and post evaluation of the, of the program. That would be important for us as, um, as a team to also uh, get feedback that will allow us to continue improving on the sessions. Uh, and before you leave, there's a small poll that will show up that is part of the ECHO protocol. Uh, I will request that you please uh, fill that poll before you check out. Also, a little, uh, a little request uh, when you come in tomorrow, we're happy to provide tech support for that. Uh, it's important that your names are displayed so that our attendance is more accurate. Our attendance registration is more accurate. I see that a lot of people are signed in from various devices. Uh, if you'd like us to assist you in helping with renaming, we're happy to do that. But uh, please uh, make sure your names are displayed or check into the chat box with your name so we know that you've been there for that session. Thank you so much. and. See you all tomorrow. Thank you.